Hello babies and gentlemen, this is the Dag speaking and um, in today's installment we're gonna be um, well seeing some situations, very bad, very severe situations economically wise that have been going on in Europe, the continent that I stem from. Okay, so the wheels are coming off. I received a, a report in one of many economic newsletters that I receive daily. And uh, I just have to share this with you, especially to those uh, of you, particularly Europeans, that think that uh, we are safer than the, our U.S. counterparts. In fact, we're not. We're even more vulnerable. And this is why. For the true horror to emerge, we need to turn up to Eastern Europe for a minute or two. Nowhere has the credit boom even more pronounced than in Eastern Europe. And nowhere is the pain felt more now than that credit has all but dried up. One measure of the credit-fueled bonanza is the deterioration of the current accounts across the region. Credit Suisse has calculated that in four short years, from 2004 to 2008, Eastern Europe's current account went from, my, from, from plus 6% of GDP to minus 6%. That is a frightening development and is likely to cause all sorts of problems over the next few years. Meanwhile, Western European banks, eager to milk the opportunities in the East after the Iron Curtain came down, have acquired many of the region's banks. Now, with many Eastern European countries in freefall, ownership could prove disastrous for an already weakened banking industry in the West. The problem is widespread. To make matters worse, the problems in the East are beginning to look systemic. Credit Suisse has produced an interesting scorecard where they rank a number of countries around the world on factors usually taken into consideration when assessing the credit quality of sovereign debt. At the top of the tree, the worst credit score, you find Iceland, hardly surprising considering their current predicament. More importantly though, of the next 14 countries on the list, 8 are Eastern European. Not what you want to hear if you are an already undercapitalized European bank with huge exposure to Eastern Europe. Swedish banks are already reeling from their exposure to the Baltic countries. Austrian banks are in even worse shape having been the most acquisitive of any European banks. Some Italian banks could be dragged under by their Eastern European exposure, and even the conservative banking sector in Switzerland doesn't look like it can escape the mayhem. Worst of all, the problems in the East are just about to unfold at a point in time where the European banking industry is bleeding heavily from massive losses already incurred in other areas. With no access to private funding, banks find it virtually impossible to rebuild their capital base with anything but taxpayers' money. U.S. banks are better off, are in lots and less of the pickle. Unlike the subprime debacle, which hit both the U.S. and European banks hard, the U.S. banks have little exposure to Eastern Europe. To prove my point, according to the IMF, European banks have 75% as much exposure to U.S. toxic debt as American banks, but 90% of all cross-border loans to Eastern Europe originate from Western European banks. And to add insult to injury, European banks have been much slower than U.S. banks in terms of recognizing their losses. Write-offs now total $750 billion in the U.S. and only about $325 billion in Europe. Now we see a chart, chart 2, that um, shows you the, um, the scorecard made by Credit Suisse. We see Iceland, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Estonia, Greece, Spain, Latvia, Romania, United Kingdom, and number 10, United States, and Ireland, Hungary, Poland, Ukraine, and number 37, China. Well. Hopefully, Portugal isn't in the first 37 percent. The Great Mortgage Show. The problems in Eastern Europe begin and end with their large external debts. In recent years, ordinary people all over the region have converted their traditional mortgages to mortgages denominated in euros, in Swiss francs, and even in yens, Japanese yens. Who can possibly resist 3 percent mortgages? Didn't anyone inform them of the risk? 
As currencies across the region have fallen out of bed in recent months, these mortgages have suddenly become 30 to 50 percent more expensive. No wonder the local economy is suddenly tanking. Now, we see some uh, graph showing the um, Eastern Europe net foreign liabilities as percentage of GDP. And Credit Suisse has calculated that the net foreign liabilities as a percentage of GDP have risen for 47% to 65% in recent months as the direct result of the loss of local currency values. Back in 1997-98, Asia went through a similar currency crisis. However, as you can see from chart 4, Asian current account deficits were much smaller than Eastern European deficits are now. So were debt levels. Despite that, the Asian crisis did enormous damage to the local economy. Eventually, Asia com came good, primarily because the devalued currencies allowed the Asian countries to export more. Eastern Europe does not share this luxury. With over 90% of the world's GDP in recession, who are they going to export to anytime soon? Austria is in greatest trouble. According to the latest estimates from BIS, Eastern European countries currently borrow 1.65 billion from abroad, three times more than in 2005, tripled in four years, and mostly denominated in foreign currencies. Ouch. 90% of that can be traced to Western European banks. Around 350 billion must be repaid or rolled over this year. Not an easy task in these markets. Austrian banks alone have lent more than 300 billion to the region, equivalent to 68% of its GDP according to Financial Times. A default rate of 10% on its Eastern European loans is considered enough to wipe out the entire Austrian banking system. EBRD has gone on record stating that defaults in Eastern Europe could end up as high as 20%. An extra, 25, uh, an extra 250 billion to the IMF. Hungary, Latvia and Ukraine have already received emergency loans from the IMF and both Serbia and Romania are reportedly considering asking for help. Meanwhile, the IMF's coffers are draining quickly and it has asked leading industrial nations for new funding. At their summit a week ago, EU leaders coughed up an extra 250 billion but nobody said where the money is going to come from. Even if they find the money, it is likely to prove hopelessly inadequate. Our leaders must grow up. Measuring everything in billions is so yesterday. Trillions are the new billions, like it or not. <sighs> Public debt to rise and rise. Even if actual losses prove to be much, much smaller, and I sincerely hope so, the banking sector cannot, in the current environment at least, raise sufficient capital to stay afloat. So more, possibly a lot more, taxpayers' money will have to be put forward. This can only mean one thing, public debt will rise and rise. The official estimate for the UK for next year is already approaching 10% of GDP, an estimate which will almost certainly rise further. We probably have to get used to running 10 to 15% deficits for a few years, a fact which seriously undermines the notion of government bonds being next to risk-free. Can Germany rescue us? Most investors remain convinced that Germany will come to the rescue. In my opinion, not as simple a solution as widely perceived given the enormity of the crisis. One possible solution, which has been mentioned frequently in recent weeks, is for all the Eurozone nations to get together and start issuing joint bonds. This would undoubtedly help the weaker nations. But the idea was shot down by the German finance minister only a few days ago when he said that closer economic harmony across the Eurozone would be needed before Germany would be prepared to entertain such an idea. The most obvious trick left in the book, therefore, is to inflate us out of this mess. With the enormous amount of public debt being created at the moment, years of deflation a la Japan would be catastrophic. You will never get a central banker to admit it, but a healthy dose of inflation is probably our best prospect of surviving this crisis. And uh, with this I don't really agree. I think we will see hyperinflation when this thing turns up. And uh, I, don't, I, don't mean, I don't even want to be here to look at it. And unfortunately we will all have to face the truth. 
Hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, don't be a downer.